What is the most visited country in the world? Is the question that I will answer by the end of this show. Hello and welcome to another episode of The More You Know Mondays. The more you know, the more you grow. And this week on the show, I will be talking about Pierre Farchard. I think that's how you say his name anyway. (laughs) But before I get into him, um, (laughs) I will start with monday motivations and you know this is how we start the show every week uh, we start with just a bit of positive vibes because this is the start of the week and sometimes it can be a bit draining after the weekend of chilling out but you know there's only five days and then the weekend is back not that you should be just living for the weekend although right now that is all we can currently live for because there's not much else you can do so yeah live for the weekend (laughs) only five days but monday is the most important day because it it starts your week and it starts your mindset so i feel like we should start with some positivity so this week's quote is by well I haven't actually found the author for this quote but I'm sure I might find it in doing my research after the show (laughs) which I know sounds backwards but it's my process man just let me do my process (laughs) funnily enough this quote goes like this if the plan doesn't work change the plan but never the goal and I really like this quote, which kind of, it's kind of funny for me because in saying what I was saying post this quote, I was thinking about this quote in my mind because I knew I was going to say it. Um, and it makes me think that th- it's a hundred percent true in the facts of usually you find that if something doesn't work out, that instead of trying to see what else could be done, some people might um, discard it altogether. And, and when I say some people, I'm included in that group because, I don't know, there's maybe certain things that I maybe started to do and I, I'll say it in the form of something that I can remember, like a like a video game. Like I started to play a level and it just got really hard up at a certain level. And instead of, although I did try and do it multiple other ways, I changed my plan multiple times and it still wasn't working. Although maybe I I wasn't thinking about it um, with a fresh mind. So what I like to do is my change of plan scenario, instead of just changing my actual game strategy and it's still failing i will take that game out and put it to the side and play some other games until i get to the point of like i've forgotten that i had the game or not that i've forgotten that i had the game or maybe it's a thing where i i think to myself oh i, I haven't played this game in a while and then i pick it up playing it with a fresh mind and then somehow I end up no longer being stuck on that level that I was originally stuck on because I've come at it with a different point of view and the different point of view comes from all my other experiences that I had experienced after I put that game down and then coming back to it with that new sensibility not even thinking, oh yeah, I'm definitely going to complete this level, 
or maybe like if I pick up the game and I think back and I'm like, oh, I remember why I put this down in the beginning. <laughs> maybe I should, um, maybe I should just give it another try out. Maybe I can complete it now. Um, but the plan could be anything really. But I think the main thing to get out of it is that just because something doesn't work out the first time that you try it in that way doesn't mean that you can't try and come back and try it in another way or try it in another way or try it in another way until it does work or you try it in a completely out of the box way and but the main aim for you is to get your final goal um which is cool and it's like i was watching this documentary randomly on i think it was itv2 and i can't even remember what day it was or anything but i think it was on itv2 but anyway it was about mark wright and i think i recognized him as like kind of a tv personality and then as the documentary was going on they said that he was on like the only way is essex and i was like oh okay cool i never watched that so that's probably why i didn't fully recognize him but i've seen him on tv before and like other things you know um but i just found it interesting that he was talking about his story of how he got into the TV personality business, or I don't say TV personality business, I mean like how he became a TV personality and he got into working in TV and everything. And he was training at Crawley FC, um, with Crawley Town FC, which is the football team that he currently plays for now. Um, and he, was was saying that how he was work he was saying playing semi professionally at Crawley Town while also working in the day or even at night after training and before training. So like he would have like minimal time to sleep but then he was still making it to training and practicing and then like after he I can't remember what it was that uh, I really can't remember exactly what it was that made him stop playing football in the beginning, but he said that he was maybe like 29, I think he said, and he decided that he was going to stop playing football, and he embarked on the route of into TV, and then after about five six years of working in tv like he has been i think it's i think that it was 29 don't 100 percent quote me on this i'm trying to use this on recall but i remember like the main things of how it pertains to this quote it is all connected 100 percent. so like he he went on and he, he'd done his tv thing and then after doing that side or exploring that side he came back to his original goal of wanting to be a footballer he he always had that thing inside of him while he was out on tv that he always wanted to play football like properly professionally so he's now come back to his roots where he started his original goal to pl be a footballer he is gonna be or gonna be doing that but like he had to change his plan and go on a completely different route before he realized that where he his actual heart does rely or where his where he want hit where his passions really do lie is in football and he's got to a point where he it obviously, I guess maybe he can, and since he can still play football, and it's something that he still wants to do, why not try it again with this fresh set of mindset, or fresh set of mindset, fresh mindset that he never had, or a different perspective on 
everything that he didn't have before when he was embarking on this uh on that journey so he he changed his plans but he still kept his original goals and still went back to that to try and um achieve it but just at a different time and it, then it worked so i don't know call it timing if you want to but the main thing is that you never give up with anything that you want to do at the end of the day like it might not work out the way that you have planned it but try something else or think outside of the box don't do what everyone else is doing do something that you haven't seen before that's the only way you can um i guess create something different or be in a different lane or have a different fan base i don't know i don't know it, what it is that you want to do but anything that it is like if you see it being done multiple times by multiple different people in the same way then that means that there's time for or there's room for a different approach it could be the same thing but just with your perception of things but yeah that's what i want you to take away usually i like break down is what i what i mean by this is but no i think i've fully explained that <laughs> so i hope you've enjoyed monday's motivations and i'll get into the show well i've started the show i'll get into the pierre farchard so who is pierre farchard um you might be asking and why are you talking about him <laughs> well i thought it would be interesting since um i work in dentistry but i'm i'm not a dentist or anything um so uh, since I, i mainly just talk on the phone to people and help with appointments and bookings and stuff like that um i'm basically just an administrator in i wouldn't say a dental surgery i work in the head office but um it's it's something that I, it's it's a job that i work in that i don't know too much about because it's not um i guess my main goal in being there although i i i, I do love my job it's not particularly what i want to do so i don't really or i didn't feel like i needed to really learn too much about dentistry as a whole rather than knowing what i need to know to do my job until i started doing this podcast where i started looking into just random interesting facts and i just i think i went into <laughs> my office at work and i was speaking to one of my bosses and i was just like a couple of my bosses and i asked if there was just any interesting facts about dentistry cuz like they they're dentists or dental nurse uh, or, or they they like managers of the area so i assume they know a lot about dentistry but there wasn't much that they could think of other than maybe the argument between um fluoride which i don't know it could be an interesting uh discussion to go into in the more you know mondays um which i will delve into maybe later in my other research but i started to look into like maybe interesting facts about dentistry you know like maybe there was interesting people i could find so i found like a whole array of interesting people in dentistry i was like yo like i don't need to know about this but i'm going to learn because it it seems a little bit interest uh it seems pretty interesting to me in the fact of 
like especially with Pierre Farchard, he's basically known as the father of modern dentistry in the sense that he created or he wrote a book about dental surgery, um, which he wrote in 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 seventeen twenty eight. So like this was almost were well, we in twenty twenty one, so <laughs> almost three hundred years ago he wrote a book which became basically the Bible for dentistry. But before we get into what he achieved, we should probably talk about where he comes from, like where he was born, when he was born. Because he, we know that he wrote a book in 1728, but Pierre Farchard was born in 1678. And luckily for Pierre, he was also born into a very modest home. So you have to assume that his family weren't rich, but they were well off. He didn't go without things. So he was born in the town of St. Denis de Gastain, uh, which is in France. So he joined the French Royal Navy at age 15. Um, and much of his family didn't agree with him joining the Navy. Um, but when he was there, he became under the influence of Alexander uh, Potelaret, who was basically a surgeon major who spent a lot of time studying diseases on teeth and mouth. And that inspired Pierre uh, Farchard. And Alexander encouraged him to look more into that side of dentistry, which wasn't really dentistry at that time yet. Um, It was just, I guess, oral and mouth surgery. And if you think about it, back in those days, it wasn't really, they wasn't really doing much treatment on teeth. It was more, if that tooth is bad, it's coming out, I guess, type of thing. So people weren't saving teeth. They were losing teeth. Which, if you think about it, isn't too dissimilar to right now. People are still losing teeth. (laughs) But it usually only happens when you get really old. Or much older. Because, um... Basically, because of what Pierre Farchard decided to um, do research into and study. So it was during the time when he was under the wing of Alexander uh, Potellerelet. I don't think that was right. Uh, Potellerelet. And during that time, he learned that sailors who were on long voyages, they suffered from a lot of dental ailments, uh, which included scurvy in particular. So eventually, through the readings of what Alexander Patellaret was teaching him, or what he was reading and inspecting and investigating through his findings from what Alexander had found, and then also looking into some of the healing arts, um he wanted to study it further so he became a combat medic and also uh, Potellaret's protege so after he left the navy he settled down in the town of Anger 
which is 200 miles or about 200 miles away from Paris. So he started to practice medicine at the University of Angers Hospital, which is where he basically pioneered dentistry. And it's crazy to think this all happened about 300 years ago. So he considered himself as a surgical dentist, which was kind of rare around those times because not many people were referring to or referred to as dentists in the 17th century. So generally, like I was saying before, like instead of treating a de- uh, treating a decayed tooth in those times they would rather just remove it altogether so that's the tooth that's having or giving you the problem okay we'll remove it <laughs> and so it, it's kind of a thing where pierre farchard basically revolutionized the whole area and looked at the goal in a different way. Instead of just removing the tooth, there must be a way that we can save and restore these teeth instead of just getting rid of them altogether because we obviously need our teeth for something. If you going around with just gums like a baby, um, you can't, bite many things as in to chew your food I mean (laughs) not that I'm going out biting random people Um, not that I can go out and bite anyone really Um, because I need to social distance from everyone and stay in this bubble until it's safe to go outside again like the Isle of Man, um, who are now all removed of social distance in restrictions, which is dope for them, but I'm still stuck. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's a, a, an, a story for another time. So what I think is cool is that while there were quite a few limitations at the time, for dentistry work or dental work um he still managed to find a way around it so there were a lot of uh instruments uh that he used from other areas that he improvised and created dental air uh, dental tools from them so he used to um, adapt tools from watchmakers, jewelers, and even barbers, where he found tools that they use that he thought could work within dentistry. So, he was actually the first person to introduce uh, dental fillings as a treatment for dental cavities. He's basically the guy that figured out that tartaric acid is the cause of dental cavities. And he also made suggestions that um, swelling around the tooth, or tumours, sorry, surrounding the tooth in the gum would appear in the later stages of tooth decay. He was the pioneer of dental prosthetics. So he discovered many, many methods for replacing lost teeth. So prosthetics, I guess that includes like false teeth and stuff like that. He figured out that there was multiple ways where if you don't have teeth, that you can have teeth. (laughs) <laughs> like false teeth you don't have teeth well I can get you teeth or I can build you a mold so you have teeth that you can use 
dun 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 false teeth. <laughs> and if there was a slogan for false teeth, that would be it. Not, a, <laughs> not exactly those words. I'm sure I can revise it, but that would basically be what it'd be. You don't have teeth. Well, I can get you teeth. Burner, burn, burner, false teeth. Burner, burn, burner, false teeth. Yeah, man. <laughs> and then on the advert, false teeth will come up and then it'll be loads of, uh, small print and it would be, uh, a subscription deal where you can get your false teeth made for you. And, um, Whenever you need them to be replaced, maybe it's every six months, you can just get a new mold made for you and you just pay a certain price. Like, if anyone's listening that can make that happen, there's like a free idea right there. (laughs) Like, I just thought about that on the spot just from the idea of a false teeth and the world that we live in, but... Maybe it's in the works somewhere, and maybe it's not. And if I do see it out there while I'm just doing random stuff, then maybe you listen to my podcast, and that's where you got the idea. So one of the methods that he used um, for artificial teeth, um, and and it was more kind of... He was trying to figure out how once they had replaced the artificial teeth which they would usually use kind of uh, I guess blocks of ivory or bone as the artificial tooth but the hard part then was holding in place this artificial tooth what would they use so he devised a way where they could use maybe um, tie the loose the artificial tooth to the remaining strong tooth teeth (laughs) um and maybe use a pivot uh which they could tie in place with either waxed thread or gold wire he also introduced dental braces although initially they were made of gold (laughs) i mean it's a strong metal i I see why but very expensive um he discovered that teeth positions could be corrected as teeth would follow the pattern that they were wired to um which is pretty cool that he figured this all out through his study in the Navy. And then he came back and pioneered the whole of dentistry. So the revolutionary book that he wrote, which was titled Le Shenzhen Dentiste. And I know I pronounced that incorrectly because it's French. And I'm not French, but I I did try but the very close translation or very rough translation would be the surgical dentist now this book was a 600 page manuscript which he compiled together And in this 600-page manuscript, which after he, you know, this was the first draft. He shared it out with the medical community around him, and he got a lot of feedback. So this 600-page manuscript turned into a 783-page manuscript. And that version was the final version, which was published in 1728 in two volumes of course (laughs) um so this book uh was very well received in the european medical community 
Um, and there was a German translation that was already made of it by 1733. But the interesting thing is that the English version or the English translation of this book didn't actually come until 1946. So we English speaking countries, although I wasn't alive back then, English speaking countries, they had to wait a whole 200 years before they were able to see the revolutionary aspects of modern men, of modern dentistry. So put it, put it in that perspective, like countries like England, they would have been 200 years behind the rest of Europe when it came to dentistry. Though in the book, Pierre Farchard looked into the dental field of prevention, the autonomy of teeth, surgery, dental surgery, uh, dental facial orthopedics, and oral diseases. And within the book, he also had like diagrams, and so you could visually see as well as the science behind it in writing, which is pretty interesting that all those years ago, he managed to figure it all out and write it down so that he could share this, what he found out or figured out with more people. So when it came to hygiene for that time, I found it interesting that the way they used to brush their teeth or clean their mouth or keep their teeth clean um, was that uh, Fairchild he believed that people should clean their teeth uh, every morning by washing their mouth with water and rubbing their teeth with a wet sponge um, he also believed that ethanol mixed with water would be a sufficient cleaning solution. And he didn't really believe much or think much of toothbrushes as he felt that a sponge could do the job much better. He recommended that if water and rubbing your teeth with sponge was not sufficient, then a mixture of coral, dragon's blood, burnt honey, seeds, see, uh, seed pearls, cutty fish bones, crayfish eyes, bal aldimer, um, and various other thing, almonds, crushed together into a fine powder um, and then rinsing your mouth out with that would help to clear anything else out that you couldn't get with just water and a sponge. <laughs> so he invented modern dentistry but I do find it interesting that the English translation took over 200 years or it took over 200 years for the this book to be translated into English. So it makes me wonder if the if dentistry in English speaking countries was still quite medieval until it came to 19 46 <laughs> or maybe in English speaking countries they also figured out the same type of thing before Pierre Farchard did or not before after Farchard but before the translation came to England or maybe or not England specifically but English speaking countries or maybe the practice was um seen 
through traveling and then brought back to um, English speaking countries, it would be interesting to look into that. Um, but that would be a fact that I share with another episode when I maybe delve into the guy who invented and mass produced the very first toothbrush. But that's for another episode as I am done for this week on uh, Pierre Farchard. But please do look more into um, Pierre Farchard if you're interested in dentistry or just curious like I was. But I promised you an answer to a question. And this week the question was what is the most visited country in the world? And surprisingly, and quite topically, since um, Pierre Farchard was from France, and, oh, I've just blown it there, (laughs) the most visited country in the world, and it has been for, from what I can see, many, many years, is France. They had about 89 million international visitors or or tourists in the last year. That's 2020. When most of the world was shut down, they still managed to get 80, about 89 million international tourists. Um, the top three countries or top four countries, which is a weird stat to mention, but it's just, these are the top four countries that I see on Google. (laughs) So the top four countries, number four is China. They have, in 2020, they had about 62 million international tourists. And then number three is the United States that had 79 million international tourists in 2020 and Spain is number two with about 82 million international tourists that they had last year and France is top and they've been top for the last couple of years which is I don't know I need to probably look deeper into why that is I'm not sure why but they have broken the world record and they had the most visitors in 2019 as well as 2018 but if you put in comparison to the amount of visitors that the UK had in 2020 the UK had about 9.7 million international visitors and that was during covid And us being in lockdown. So, I mean, sounds crazy to me that we could even have around 10 million people still coming internationally in and out of the country when we have a global pandemic going on. And even, yeah, it just sounds a bit crazy, but it is what it is. We need to make money from tourism somehow, I guess, right? Isn't that right, government? (laughs) but anyway i'll call that the end of the show so i hope that you have enjoyed listening to this week's episode on pierre farchard and do look more into the subject if you're interested in it and if maybe dentistry isn't your thing maybe you can look into previous other episodes if you if this is the first episode that you are listening to and If it is the first episode that you're listening to, welcome to the fold. Welcome to learning more. And the more you know, the more you grow with the knowledge that you learn. A very long-winded way of saying whatever I was trying to say, but welcome. (laughs) And thank you for listening if you have listened this far into the episode. Um, It's much appreciated, as I said before. And yeah hope you check it out next week and check out the previous episodes this podcast i don't know where you're listening to it but 
It's available everywhere, to my knowledge, even on YouTube. If you're on YouTube and you've thought, yeah, let me find it on there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've got no much more, not much more to say about Pierre Farchard in this episode. But other than keeping the Monday affirmation strong by never giving up. And if it doesn't work one way, I'll try it another way until it does work. But that's where I leave it. Thank you for listening. Bye.